continue with the double method. Then we're gonna jump into Bayes. We'll go a little bit light, but we're digging into chapter seven. So I'm gonna be telling you stuff from chapter seven um, concerning their language in the book, what they use in terms of Bayes estimators. So they do start talking about Bayes estimators early in the book. They never tell you what, what it is. This is very similar to um, when I did my early Bayesian example, I was just coming up with some statistics. I didn't do the full derivation for you or anything like that. But I said there's a Bayes estimator, and David from Pines asked, which Bayes estimator? And Bayes gives you a full distribution. So I said it's the mean. And the book does the same thing. So they say the Bayes estimator is the mean, and those of you that are more advanced than that will go, yeah, under some assumptions. And you didn't say it. So that's the hard part of writing a book, is you gotta start somewhere and coax people into it, and there's no great starting point. You just kinda have to iterate a few times. So you try it. <laughs> you know, if you think there's a better starting point than what the book uses. I actually think this book is really good because it tries to cover a lot of stuff and put it all together, which is nearly impossible to do in one book. So, but if you think there's a better starting point, after a couple exercises of you getting through, you'll go, oh shoot, I have to do some hand waving at some point. The problem with the book is it reads linearly, but it's really, you skip around it if you're reading it correctly. So hopefully you're still reading the book and getting ahead. We're gonna be diving into chapter six formally, but informally, we're touching other chapters early on. So today, we'll do, we'll finish up the first order delta method. I'm just saying that because that's the way the book presents it. Most people will just call this the delta method. And there is a second order variant. I've never seen anybody use it in practice. In all my years of seeing silly analyses, this one has never come up. But I think it's interesting because it helps you to understand where the method kind of works and where it fails. So if you understand the extension of the second order, it means you understand the first order method. That's what I really want to focus on. So today, delta method, aka the first order method, and then we'll just allude to the second order method. So usually it seems like in my experience, if I tell you don't worry about something, that's exactly what you'll worry about, which is really weird. So I'm not trying to trick you. I, I would be inclined to say don't worry about the central limit there, but worry about it. <laughs> going to ask you at some point. Guaranteed there's a promise there. Okay, delta method. Um, and then I think what we'll do is we'll go through um, Bayes afterwards. We'll start with some history of what is this stuff, where the controversies lie, what people have been talking about, and how all this has kind of shifted over time. So next base, start with history. In a few examples. It's just a paradigm. It's a way of operating. If you want guarantees in all of that stuff on what the estimators are, it's the exact same thing if you were a non-Bayesian. You come up with an estimator at the end of the day, kind of doesn't matter how you got it, you still evaluate it the same way. So at the end of the day, once you have a Bayesian estimator, all of the evaluation tools are exactly the same. So it's a paradigm for guiding you into deriving estimators. And there's really good properties in Bayes. So my favorite thing about it is joint estimation. We won't really see that until later. It's different from just one dimensional estimation. So I mean multiple parameters and it associates them together. I like that. They have to be co-estimated. So an example of not doing that is in a normal distribution talking about x bar and s squared. And I understand that they are independent of the statistics, but the parameters are associated. So there's a difference there. And so it gives you an opportunity to win. And then I, I do like the prior, cautiously. You know, it's a regularizer. I like constraints on problems. I like dampening the, the stochasticity in areas where I know things shouldn't be jumping around a lot. So I like that tool. So any lever, any tool can be abused. So we want to understand at least the guiding light principles so that we don't 
derived stuff that we know is going to be suboptimal. I mean, at the end of the day, you're probably going to do a simulation study too, so you're still going to compare in kind of an honest way to every other estimator. So phase is a way of thinking about things. Okay, um, we'll get into that after we conclude with the delta method. So we need a proof. So let's just write down a statement of the delta method first. We've seen this a couple times. So this says this. If there's a YN, a sequence of random variables, I like to think about X bar. Something like this. So I can transform and call that thing this new thing over here. So I'm usually thinking about that. I'm usually thinking about the IID case. But uh, the statement's a little stronger than that. So this minus theta, where that's the expectation of YN, we map back to this, it would be the expectation of these xi's, which is the expectation of the x bar. The same expectation. Different variances. So this, divided by root n, this converges to a normal 0, 1. And I think the book switches around where this parameter is in the statement. It doesn't matter, we'll just leave it there. So hopefully you're nimble enough that I could either make that a one and a sigma squared here, so it's just a scaling parameter. So I'll just kind of point out, if I did something like this, C, right here, what would change over here? NBC squared. That's right. That's how things scale. Get rid of that. We'll see that in a minute. Let's make some other um, comments about this before we make the statement of the delta method. The statement of the delta method concerns transforms. So delta method is concerning transforms of this random variable. So we want to understand the distribution of that. Now I get it. Why do any of this? Did I just do that thing that we did in probability class where I just transformed the thing? Some problems are harder than others. So sometimes you need to set up like some sort of a bijection between things and doing all of that work could be hard. If you don't have one to oneness in things, that can be very hard. So doing the math is sometimes hard, so this is an approximate detection. If this was the 1960s, I'd be more excited about this technique. So I think there's merit here, but really I think that there's ways of understanding probability theory. And then later on we need to compare for various problems when this thing works. Is, is another reason the fact that it approximates it as normal, but if you did an actual transform, it might not be normal as you could apply normal. But you could if it's close, right? Because nothing's ever normal. So how do we use this statement? This says yn is approximately normal with mean theta variance sigma squared over n. It's kind of true, it's kind of close, so it's not, nothing is, nothing, nothing is what you want it to be, the question is, is it close? So I think what you're saying, aren't there some cases where it's just dramatically different? And we'll see a case like that where it's like this approximation is just entirely useless and we'll see what goes wrong. But you've seen my Bayes class before. So you've seen examples where Bayesian does inference off of a beta, but somebody else might use a normal. We'll see that example again in this class. So one is better than the other. Okay, let's just comment on this just a little bit more. So this is the if part of everything. We'll write down the then part in a second, and this is what we'll be proving, but I just want to dwell on this for a second. So in the limit, as n goes to infinity, so I'm taking the limit over here on this thing, I could write this exactly the same. I could say the limit, n goes to infinity, this thing goes to normal zero. So not a hard question, what is this converging to? 
different. So, you know this. The denominator sigma over root n converges to zero. So that's easy to do, sigma's a number. So this is gonna be a caveat if you wanna talk about a normal distribution, any which way you need sigma to be defined, it needs to be a number. It's one of the underlying parameters of the distribution and you just can't get away from it. So note, this converges to zero. So here's another question, how fast does it do this? How fast is that going to zero? And when we're asking, asking this question, this is as a function of n. How do you answer that question? I see a picture in my mind of this thing decaying down towards zero. So this has some sort of decay pattern. It's that curve that we're drawing. So how do we explain what that curve looks like? We basically look at the shape of this function, how fast this thing is going off to infinity. So how fast n is going to infinity determines how fast that thing goes to zero. That makes sense. So when somebody asks this question, how do you answer? I'm just curious what you would say. Differentiate. What's that? Differentiate. I don't need to differentiate, I can just stare at it. But you're right, it's something about the tangent you know, this sort of thing, how fast is that going? But it's tangents changing depending on what n is. You'd say this goes as fast as n one half That's it. So the exact same thing. So, if you're in a computer science class, how would you notate this? Or in a math class? Big O. Big O. So, it's actually exacto. <laughs> it's hard O. So, big O is the upper bound, little O is the lower bound. I don't care if you understand that. It's O. <laughs> so, usually we say the order of the convergence. is O n one half. That's it. So order n one half, and I think we all understand the concept. That's the order at which it does this. This is the asymptotic function, how fast this thing is decaying down towards zero, and how we notate that is just as fast as n is converging, because that's the only thing that converges here. So that's our notation. So that's not an abstract concept, it's just a graph that you're imagining in your mind. That's how fast it does that. Let me just ask a similar question. So we know that if this is converging to something that's not blowing off to infinity, so this is converging to zero, this must also be converging to something. If this converged to a finite number that was non-zero, that number would blow off to infinity. So what is the numerator doing? What's this converging to? Y n minus theta is converging to what? Also zero. Also zero. Has to. So if it went to anything else, let's say five, this would be going off to zero. So I'd be taking something five dividing it by infinity. And what's that? Or I'd be five times infinity. So and it'd be blown off towards infinity, which is not a normal zero one. So we know instantaneously that this thing has to be converging to zero, if that's converging to zero. Here's my question. How fast does this happen? This is the whole crux of the proof. The same rate as the denominator. It better be. If it's converging to zero faster, this thing would converge just to a point zero. Guaranteed. So if it were converging to zero much, 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 much slower, then this thing would become zero so much faster than that that we would start dividing by the zero effectively and this thing would be going off to infinity. So it has to be going to zero at the exact same rate. If you don't understand that, you don't know what a derivative is. So all those derivatives, we have these differential terms, 
we needed the numerator and the denominator both to be going to zero at the same rate for everything to, uh, to work out. So when you first took lim looked at limits, they had you working through polynomials, very similar to what we did with the central limit theorem, and you kind of understood it that way. Here's just another way of expressing all that. Instead of factoring out the term, like you were kind of doing, this would be the factorized term. So that's what we're looking at. So same thing they taught you in calculus class. So if this was, again, let me just ask this question. So let me answer this. I'll just say O and 1 half. So that's kind of cool. It's saying that central limit theorem we're gaining it at that rate, n one half, which is relatively fast. I don't know. It could be faster. So if it were linearly fast, I would like that better. So we learn about our data and its distribution at rate root n. If it were n, it would be faster. For n squared, it'd be even faster. We'd learn very, very quickly about things. This isn't too bad. So this is telling us how fast the central limit theorem is kicking in. So, and you'll see that, and people go, that's pretty fast. Um, let me just look at this. Yn minus theta, let's just say raised to the square. This also goes to zero, because that thing is going to zero. The square is pushing it down even faster. So if that number was 0.01, squaring it would make it 0.001. It makes it much, much smaller. So there's an order to this, how much smaller it is it's coming through the square. So that's going to zero. Question, how fast? It's not a hard question. Exactly. It's just into the one? Yeah, exactly. So. Again, yeah, not really a trick concept. It would be like O to the N one half. That's how fast that's going, but I'm squaring it. So that's converging linearly fast. So that's converging much, much faster. So if I were looking at something like this, Yn minus theta squared over sigma over root N, how fast, what would that go to? That goes to zero. That actually goes to the point zero. So it's not going to be fluttering around zero and drifting off. It's getting smashed into zero. So what about that? Even faster, smash into zero. So what about that? No. That doesn't go to zero anymore. This is going down a little bit too slow compared to this. So this is going to start converging to zero and ducking under that thing and blowing this thing off to infinity. So the break point is one. So if I do plus epsilon where that's positive, any number right here, this would converge to zero. So smash it into zero. It would take a while, but it would end up hammering that thing straight into zero. If I subtract it off a positive epsilon, even something tiny, then it would not go to zero. Okay, so hopefully you saw that like not go to zero and go to zero. That's my whole point. That's what you're going to explain in the proof. So we need that little preliminary to just understand. But when you hear people say the central limit theorem is an n one half asymptotic sort of thing, that's where that's coming from. We're just staring at the denominator. So and the n is coming through root n. So if this happened to be coming in at some other speed. Uh, the convergence would be determined by whatever that function of n is. Hopefully that makes some sense to you. I think we're ready for proof. We're at least ready for a statement. So then, this is it. G, Y, N, minus G theta, square root, sigma, root n. This is going to converge to a normal, zero. And somebody help me out, somebody that's read the book or at least has digested what I said before. What's this? Sigma squared, g prime. 
I got my stigma here. Oh, they all love it. <laughs> so that sounded almost like part of me. G prime theta squared. So we're squaring that thing out. The way the book writes it is they slide the sigma over both sides. So if you understand everything, it's all the same to you. I will point out, sometimes we don't know that. And so we estimate it. And everybody ends up making it seem like it just doesn't matter. It can matter, but in terms of the asymptotics, it doesn't. So just remember, S squared is equal to sum of the xi's minus x bar squared over n minus 1 if I were doing some sort of typical analysis and I didn't know sigma, I would end up using this. And then if I wanted s, I take the square root of that, square root over the top of that, and I can see how fast this thing is converging. We know that that's converging to zero, same sort of thing. So this thing must be converging as well. And so if this thing is going to be converging to something, we need both of them to, to do some sort of convergence right here. So this is converging at the same rate. So that doesn't foul up the asymptotics. When we write this sort of O notation, we're getting rid of all the constants. So eventually, all these curves that are O and 1 half, or something like that, they all eventually asymptote into the same place. When they start asymptoting or getting close, is different. And so it's not enough for me to say two things are asymptotically equivalent because I'm never dealing with anything even close to infinity. So I think it matters. So how fast this is converging in terms of the constants has to deal with the process underlying all of that. So the asymptotics are still n one half, but the constant matters. Okay, so the then statement. I guess I'll just leave this up. G Y N minus G theta over sigma root n converges to a normal zero. G prime theta squared. We'll just keep that up. Just like our other proof for the central limit theorem, the whole crux of this proof is kind of showing that asymptotically the remainder doesn't matter, and that's what I want you to finesse the explanation about, especially if you're taking a qualifying exam. I'll tell you exactly what I'm looking for. Okay, so let's do a proof. So I'm gonna say G Y N is gonna be equal to G theta plus g prime theta, I can divide by one factorial and zero factorial right there if you'd like. I prefer not to. I'm centering everything at theta in the Taylor expansion. This is plus a remainder where the remainder looks like this. Sum k goes from two to infinity. g k theta divided by k factorial, yn minus theta to the k. Asymptotically, everything is determined here. So we're taking a limit over n, so we have to eyeball where all the n's show up. The part I think that confuses people is the n's show up in the other proof in the, the polynomial terms a little bit differently. So the way they're appearing is different, so the way you're thinking about the limit is different. So just be hyper aware of that. You start mixing those two proofs, I know you don't understand both of them. So, so try to untangle these steps. So when we're doing everything, when we're thinking about the limit, this thing is converging to theta right here. And again, that's weak law of large numbers, strong law of large numbers, the central limit there, we've already proved that, so we can use that. That's all converging. This is this statement right here. So, okay. So we want to look at this term upstairs. I'll divide in a second. This is pretty easy. So this is an approximation, and this has assumptions.
What are the assumptions? That's it. Yeah. So statement, I'm writing them down, so I must mean that they exist. So the derivatives exist. This is the part where the delta method focus on. This is the linear approximation. Question. So I'll kind of point out the delta method already just by analyzing what it does. The method could be good, be, or let me say it the other way. The method could be bad because the linear approximator is horrible. So it could be bad because where we're centering it is not the right thing, even though that's where the mean is. The mean might not encompass the mass of the distribution. We're a little bit guarded on that because of this. The central limit theorem statement that's saying the mass is all concentrated at, a, at zero itself. Or, sorry, the mass is all concentrated at theta because it's normally distributed. And we know what a normal looks like. All the mass is there. It's not a binomial. So we're kind of guarded against that, but we're still saying the linear approximation is good. And we're also um, thinking that the central limit theorem is kicking in rather fast, meaning that the constants aren't kicking over everything. So the asymptotic rate is kicking in fast. OK, so GYN minus G theta, that's just equal to G prime theta y n minus theta plus this remainder. Anytime I'm going to take a limit over something, I like to denote that that, that parameter, that whatever I'm taking a limit over appears. This is just a placeholder to remind us. So that's pretty easy. All we've done is subtract off this part right here. So a book does that rather fast. I think they just say, they end up writing down some equation real quickly. So we're just walking through the steps. So that's what that looks like. So G Y N minus G theta over sigma root N. This looks like this. G prime theta Y N minus theta plus Rn over sigma over root n. So those are the same things. Just subtract it, just rescale the whole problem. You can almost see the proof based off of everything that we've already gone through. So let's just think about this. What is this part converging to? And goes to infinity. I just erased it. It's going to a normal distribution. Go on to a normal. That's our assumption. So when I multiply this part in, what does this whole thing go to? That whole thing with this part being scaled back in is going to a normal <coughs> zero to one. Oops. I'll write it like this times g prime theta, which is equal to a normal zero g prime theta squared. So that's where that squared is coming from. It's just a rescaling of that normal right there. So here would be a poor proof. I get it. Yeah, it's true, but you need to explain so why that actually happens. So this is what I think would be really bad. If you did this on a midterm and you just wrote down this, and you just said, I'm just going to chuck it from the very beginning, and I'm just going to write this. It's just right. So if you started the proof out g prime theta, yn minus theta, 
and you just ended up writing that out and you just said it's approximately and you're not dealing with the asymptotics, saying what happens in terms of n, I get that you get the bulk of everything. So, but you threw away the remainder too soon. So I don't want to see that. I want you to carry the remainder for a moment more. You can break this up into sums. Taking limits over sums is the easiest thing you can do because you can take the limit over both chunks. And then just add them together and see what happens. Okay. So we're going to be a little bit more formal about this and not get rid of that thing so fast. Let's be careful. So we're going to analyze. Rn over sigma over root n. So this is the part that just indicates I know you understand the details. So I start seeing you look at this part of everything. I've just broken this up into two chunks. I'm going to analyze this thing. I know this chunk is converging to something finite. And so now I can just add it to this thing right here. That's Slutsky's theorem. It's a version of Slutsky's theorem. In chapter two, if you haven't had a full-blown real analysis class or a measure theory class, that stuff doesn't mean a lot to you in terms of the formalized proofs. I think you understand it conceptually, though. Okay. So this part is just, I'll just write it all out if you like. It's going to be G2 over 2 factorial yn minus theta 2 plus, and I'm just going to write all this stuff right here. k goes from 3 to infinity, gk, yn minus theta, k over k factorial. Again, there's no asymptotics here or here. I'll put that in that centered in theta. So we'll write down the denominator again. What we know from Taylor's theorem is that the remainder is governed by the smallest order term. If you're Alex, you'll just write down the whole term, do some factorization. So that's fine. Totally works for me. So, or you could just talk about the smallest order term. So this is the one that's converging the slowest in everything. So we'll just write it out real slowly. This term is asymptotically let's just make up a, a word governed, determined, something like that. By the term yn minus theta squared right here. And we can end up cutting all this stuff in if you insist. Doesn't really change the asymptotic. So as soon as I write this word, I don't care about constants. So, and let's just be really pedantic about this. I.e., in higher order terms, gk theta over k factorial yn minus theta to the k or k greater or equal to 3 converge faster than 4 k is equal to by this term. So you can kind of just start pointing to things. Can you prove that? I just don't care. You know? So at that point, I, if, you don't, if you don't know what a power is, you can't prove it. But if you knew what a power was, you understand it. So I'm good enough for that. So this is about the level of the proof. I just want you to talk about the terms and explain that they're converging faster. Kind of like what we did on the board. So just say a few words about it. So make sure that I'm honed in on you being honed in on this. So that means that yn minus theta squared.
squared. Again, don't really care about these, but I'll just keep writing them in so that somebody doesn't ask, where did these things go? Get rid of the factorial. This converges to zero at rate on. Again, you don't have to say this. You can just say that it's going to zero faster than the non-powered up term. Lots of ways to say that. Which is faster than, I'll say sigma over root n goes to zero, which is at rate. O and half. So if I were doing the proof, I'd probably bring in this big O notation and talk about it. If you just want to factor out polynomial terms, I'll consider the exact same thing. So at some point, you need to just say, so limit n goes to infinity Rn sigma over root n goes to zero. So, the, so this thing is converging to a zero, and this thing's converging to a distribution. That's actually the full blown Slutsky statement in chapter two, if you want to look back over that. So kind of stuff that you just think is obvious. I don't know how obvious it is. It's like obvious to people at different levels. OK. So I guess we can just conclude and just end up writing. So in conclusion, g y n minus g theta over sigma over root n converges to g prime theta y n minus theta over sigma over root n. Because we've already said this. If you want to get really formal, you can say by an application of Slutsky's theorem, this is true. I don't know, you just add two things together is all that they're saying. I'm adding something that converges to a distribution, and I'm adding something that converges to a point, and that point is zero. What do you think it converges to? So this thing right here again is normal zero one. So the whole thing converges to a normal zero g prime theta squared. Again, how you handle the sigma, I don't really care. The book when they do it, they just flip the root end over to the top. And that's it. So that's the proof. If you'd like to feel a little bit better about this. QED. All kinds of ways to denote you're done. You don't have to punctuate it at the end of the day. I'll know that you're done. So, but if you like doing that sort of stuff, it makes you feel good. It used to make me feel good too, and I don't do it anymore. Any questions? That's the delta method. Let's just look at this second order thing for just a second. So we're done with that. I think just to think about this a little bit further, let's say we use the second order approximator. Just for argument's sake, this is the part we kicked everything off in conversation with and I wanted you to look at in the book. Note. So, I'll say G, let's see, let's say if I took GYN and I wrote this down as G theta plus G prime theta YN minus theta plus the second order term, the second derivative term, 